Um, so I'd like to formally introduce myself. My name is Laura Mkumba. I'm a second year Master of Science student in Global Health here at Duke. And I will be facilitating and moderating Global Health History Seminar number 141, titled Global Health Futures. So the field of global health is inherently interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral, and international. Teams that convene to address the world's most pressing global health issues are typically built out of Global South, Global North collaborations. These collaborations, however, were and continue to, continue to be established in power dynamics, in unequal power dynamics. The goal of this panel is to explore how these power dynamics have developed by exploring different case studies and perspectives from global health practitioners around the world and imagine global health futures from a decolonial praxis. Our first speaker is Dr. Jean Richardson, an assistant professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. His overall focus is on biosocial approaches to epidemic disease prevention, containment, and treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa. As part of this effort, he is chair of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. Welcome, Dr. Jean Richardson. This is the best conference I've ever been to, so you guys, you guys are awesome. Um, and I'm going to give my, uh, yeah, game. My, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my, I'm going to give my impressions as a, um, you know, uh, from a place of privilege as a white, cisgender male, um, settler, colonialist, who, um, you know, doesn't know, I'm not going to speak from what it's like to be harmed, but I've worked for UN, WHO, CDC, Doctors Without Borders, Partners in Health, Harvard, Stanford. Uh, so I, I'm speaking from what I've seen the harmers do. Um, so let's get on to some uh, coloniality. And thanks so much for the first panel for uh, setting the stage for us. Um, here's a quote. Uh, the, heter the heterogeneous and multiple global structures put in place over a period of 450 years did not evaporate with juridical political decolonization of the periphery over the past 50 years. We continue to live under the same colonial power matrix. With juridical political decolonization, we move from a period of global colonialism to the current period of global coloniality. Uh, decoloniality, so someone in here might recognize this quote. It unsettles the singular authoritativeness and universal character typically assumed and portrayed in academic thought. It seeks connections and correlations, illuminating pluriversal and interversal paths that disturb the totality from which the universal and the global are most often perceived. It is necessarily tied to the lived context of struggle, struggles against the structures, matrices, and manifestations of modernity, coloniality, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, among other structural, systemic, and systematic modes of power, and for the possibilities of an otherwise. It is the process. I took the, this is an extended quote from your book. I, uh, <laughs> and it's in, a, in the book I'm writing now. It's in a little box on the side, so I love it. Um, it is the process of project of building, shaping, enabling colonialities. Otherwise, it demands changing the terms of the conversations, making visible the tricks and the designs of the puppeteer. It aims at altering the principles and assumptions of knowledge creation, transformation, and dissemination. Its epistemic practices targets the conceptual narratives that sustain and legitimize the implementation of Western global designs. And I'm sorry if I fly through this. I got 50 slides, and I'm going to go super quick. Uh, so here, why am I showing this? This is part of the, uh, the, the acting job of, of people in my position to show their experts. So here I am in my. Per, uh, personal protective equipment for the uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak there, and then for the DRC outbreak in my uh, bulletproof vest that the UN gave to us. Um, and don't be fooled by these demonstrations of expertise, because expertise is a repository of corrupt judgment designed to suppress promising alternatives to already bankrupt positions. <laughs> it's seen negatively as a major source of in information bottlenecks. And here's a good example I love. Uh, so for those of uh, uh, health practitioners in the room, uh, they basically showed that at, the <laughs> at our hospital, um, when the cardiology professors go to the, their conference, the, the outcomes for people with heart attacks and heart failure are significantly better. <laughs> so when the experts have left uh, and the general docs are there, the, the outcomes for the things they're supposed to be outcome in are better. So what does expertise even mean? For me, it means 
It's just an imposition of, uh, you know, a hegemonic worldview. Uh, but we call it social science or we call it expert opinion. Um, anyway, I'm going to try to compare and contrast experiences in uh, Sierra Leone and DR Congo and then get to some uh, a bit of analysis. So here are the two posters. Um, start with Sierra Leone. Containment basically started by calling this 117 number. Uh, they would send the call to these district Ebola response centers. So I was the clinical lead for Partners in Health at, at the Kono District Ebola Response Center. And we'd send out an alert, uh, verify that it was a case. And if, if there was a case, we'd send out the ambulance. People would get in their PPE um, to bring uh, patients for what they said, isolation treatment, uh, isolation testing and treatment. In the first place I worked with Doctors Out Borders, there was no treatment. They just, they would not allow us to put in IVs, um, which was, you know, very problematic for the clinicians there. Uh, we essentially just served as, um, to isolate people. So I moved over to Partners in Health where the mandate was to uh, treat people. Um, and here's some more of the experience. We did these uh, village sweeps with the military and we can talk more about it uh, afterwards or at the reception. Um, here we are going on the house to house missions um, trying to see if people are uh, fit the case descriptions and we can bring them over for actual treatment. Here's what one of the Ebola treatment units looked like once we, you know, people got their acts together. This took three months to build in Port Loco and by the time uh, the, the, it was finished, the outbreak had already moved to a new district. Um, Partners in Health did things a bit differently, partnered with the uh, Ministry of Health and, um, and just set up a pretty ramshackle ETU in, a, um, in an old, I think, uh, vocational training facility. And in the end, and you know, we were told at MSF that we couldn't put in IVs because it was dangerous for health workers. In the <coughs> end, our sloppy ETU had much less staph infections than the MS1, MSF ones did. So um, there's, there's coloniality even in uh, treatment campaigns. We decentralized the response and built these uh, CCCs, community care units, 12 bed units dispersed throughout uh, the, the districts. Here it is at night. Uh, so what's different in the DRC outbreak? Well, we have a vaccine now. Uh, we didn't have a vaccine back then and uh, it's very effective, 95% uh, protection. Uh, this is the Merck vaccine here. There's also a second one from Janssen that's an uh, adenovirus construct, but it's, it's protective of uh, Marburg and other species. But the problem is, is it takes two jabs and it's hard enough to get people to uh, do one jab. So here we are in a vaccine campaign in DRC and out of a village of 200 people, about 10 people accepted the vaccine. Um, and we'll get to discussions of that. Diagnostics are different. So it used to take three, four days sending samples all the way to you know, the capital in Freetown. Now we have this little Cepheid gene experts. You can put in a cartridge for uh, Ebola and have an uh, answer within two hours. All you need is electricity and a laptop. We also have therapeutics now. Uh, the last two have been shown to be over 90% um, curative, essentially. They're antibody cocktails, or one's a single monoclonal. Um, we also have these Ebola cubes that uh, here, this one allows us to do cesarean sections, uh, take vitals, all sorts of things. But the case fatality rates overall in both outbreaks are no different. 68% and 70%. So all these tools, all these therapeutics, there is no difference in, in mortality rates. And Ebola is actually not a very deadly disease. If you have access to a good ICU, less than 10% mortality. Most people don't know that. They think of it as this Richard Preston, hot zone craziness. That's sensationalism. Um, so why? Why are they the same in both places when we have all these new tools? So a little segue. Colonialism imposed its control of the social production of wealth through military conquest and subsequent political dictatorship. But its most important area of domination was the mental universe of the colonized, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. And this is what I think global do health does these days. They tell people why they're sick and they tell them, the reasons they tell them that they're sick are usually because of their own ignorance or some sort of uh, behavioral problem. Uh, Lancet ID published this study that said it's essentially institutional uh, mistrust, misinformation, people believing in conspiracy theories. This is why um, we have the same mortality in uh, West Africa as we have in 
Congo because no one's using any of this stuff because they're ignorant or they, they don't believe that Ebola is real. And one quote said, researchers said their study showed more precisely how individuals' misinformed views about Ebola were undermining the response and helping to spread the deadly virus. Helping to spread the deadly virus. So that, this is the usual kind of epidemiological graph that shows why, you know, viral transmission dynamics. You have it circulating in bats and primates, it does a zoonotic jump to the humans, they pass it around at funerals, they pass it around in the, in the city, and, and then it's amplified in health centers. No dynamic takes a look at this right here, this, this dynamic. So um, this is from Honest Accounts, 2017 publication with the, that partnered with the Jubilee campaign. And it essentially shows how development is a farce. So $162 billion go into the continent of Africa in the year 2017 in aid, remittances, and loans. $203 billion comes out in illicit financial flows, not just repatri repatriation of profits, illicit flows. So tax evasion, resource theft, and trade misinvoicing. So the continent is a $40 billion creditor to the global north. They are developing us. You know, development goes that way. And there's another picture of it there. So different ways of thinking about, uh, you know, the dynamics of circulation of viruses and monies. You know, you'll never learn this one in, in the schools of public health. But I think uh, when you start to focus on it, you'll see how determinative it is. In DRC, you know, no one's really talking about this is from um, Adam Hochschild's um, uh, King Leopold's Ghost. Here's a guy, I mean, he's looking at his daughter's hands that have been chopped off. You don't think that the memories of this float down 200 years to rep <laughs> represent mistrust in new foreigners coming with, uh, whether it's academic extraction or, um, as we'll get to, um, more mineral extraction. Um, I want to give a quick uh, bit more of social theory and describe what the uh, habitus is, uh, theory promoted by Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and it's socialized norms or tendencies that guide behavior and thinking. It's the way society becomes deposited in persons in the form of lasting dispositions or trained capacities and structured propensities to think, feel, and act in determinate ways which then guide them. So were we to appreciate this containment mistrust as an inclination, a cognitive tendency, or a structured disposition towards eluding depredation, which has been going on for over 200 years, not simply as a rational calculation based on misinformation, then its capacity as a mediator in a determinative web of human rights abuses that stretch back in time and link the DRC to distant continents could rise to the level of common sense. I'm trying to do this with some modelers at UCSF where you know, most modelers are prisoners of the proximate, right? They, they can only use well-defined downstream variables to tell you what's going on here. Like how do we start to parameterize upstream determinants? Is it even possible with some of the computational modeling we're doing? Um, and there's some examples of the uh, large-scale atrocities which are determinative, uh, which help determine uh, Ebola transmission dynamics today. And so what I think global health is doing is, th you know, they're part of a system that has put out the people's eyes and then they're reproaching them for their blindness. And that's from Milton, 642. Um, Neocolonial epidemiology is not set up for challenging health inequalities, but, it, but rather justifies them. In short, all these analyses that we see in Lancet, most of them pretty much autoclave imperialism's backstory. So cultural hegemony, if exploited, exploitative socioeconomic relations are indeed foundational to the, to the social order, then this is likely to have a fundamental shaping effect on social ideation, including the, the ideas that are, circulate at schools of public health and help us you know, determine what kind of global health inventions we're going to do. Uh, you know, they're based on, for lack of a better word, models of uh, you know, bourgeois empiricism. They're, these are called models of disease causation that obscure socio-historical forces. They are themselves political acts. They give support to social structures that hide behind scientific objectivity and perpetuate dependency, exploitation, racism, elitism, and colonialism. Here's, a, here's some you know, semiotics basically uh, analyzing a, a New England Journal article that, that says that super spreaders were responsible for you know, something like 60 to 80% of Ebola transmission in West Africa. Uh, a super spreader is a human who infects more than 20 people, um, so a, a victim of a disease that goes on to uh, infect a number of other people. They're targeted for global health interventions. So we could find that imam who's going to have a funeral that everybody attends, then we could really nail this outbreak. Um, and so these type of 
uh, interpretations, um, these type of social science studies. I think I, I like to use Foucault's little, uh, Foucault's little rubric about people know what they do. So these co-authors are public health experts. They know why they do what they do. They are dedicated to proving the health of populations. They don't, what they don't know is what what they do does. They do not realize how they impart epistemological currency to terms like superspreader, which pernici perniciously divert us from structural determinants um, and posit individuals and their unconstrained calculating agency as the engines of transmission. As such, tangible sources of exploitation disappear behind facades of object objective rationality. And here you saw in the newspaper, superspreaders cause more than 60% of inf infections. If superspreading had been completely controlled, almost two-thirds of the infections might have been prevented. Well, here's a superspreader, I think. This is Anglo Golashanti. They are uh, a gold miner in DRC in North Kivu. And 92% 90 of the wealth that comes out of the ground goes to foreign owners. 8% goes to the Kinshasa you know, internal colonizers. So there's nothing in Kivu to show for all this wealth that's coming out of the ground. Uh, biggest owner of, uh, majority owner of Anglo Gold Ashanti, John Paulson. John Paulson donated $400 million to Harvard and they named the School of Engineering after him. I am complicit in all of this because I am at this <laughs> university. And but don't worry, we're planning protests. So they're building a new, <laughs> yeah, I, I should try and get tenure first, right? This is going to really, uh, uh, probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, they're building a new building. We're going to go protest it. We're all, this is to show how we're complicit. Duke, you know, this is global health is local. You can find parts of Duke that are, uh, that need decolonization. I went here as an undergrad. Uh, it was probably one of the most segregated places I've ever seen in my life. I've lived on every continent except for Antarctica. So there's plenty of work to be done here, Harvard, and all the other places. I made this little graphic. Sorry. Yeah, I'll talk louder. I made this little graphic, uh, so here we are, this is the, the mine, here we got the School of Engineering, and here we got, in Latin, um, monopoly on truth, instead of veritas, which is just the truth that usually uh, adorns the Harvard logos. Here's another co coloniality of knowledge production, just one more minute. So here's a mod, here it gets into modeling as well, so here's a difference equation that basically shows that development assistance, uh, it, health is associated with improvements in health indicators, so it's like, Neoliberal model, yeah, you give money through USAID and all the health indicators increase, so let's support this mode of aid. Uh, you can't see this here. Here's some epistemic reconstitution that Prof. Mignolo talked about. I added a single variable on illicit financial flows and, and basically found that the decreases in under five mortality that they showed nearly offset by um, increases associated with uh, illicit financial flows. Aid, therefore, to a state is merely revolving credit paid by the neo-colonial master. This is Kwame Nkrumah. We can talk about it later. So last slide, decolonizing health, global health is not just about journal authorship. Uh, uh, we have to democratize knowledge production, delink it from, this is all Daniela's words, from the colonial matrix of power, make the Euro-centered epistemology hidden in public health science more transparent, and by tracing human rights failings to the impoverished, discursive infrastructure of objectivist epidemiology, we can transform global health by transforming, its reparation, uh, <laughs> by transforming its representations, we formed this Lancet Commission that we're doing symbolic reparations as well. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Deborah Jensen. She's a professor of Romance Studies here at Duke University. Dr. Jensen founded the uh, Health Humanities Lab, and her current global health work focuses on the invention of ethno-psychiatry in Haiti in relation to critique of European neuroscience and emerging mental health fields. So we welcome you, Dr. Jensen. Well, uh, hello. Um, thank you for being here with us all. It's really such a privilege to be with, with all of you. And uh, I want to thank my um, wonderful Global Health Humanities colleague, uh, Kearsley Stewart, and these extraordinary Duke Global Health graduate students who are really blazing a trail with this conference. And it is an honor, indeed, to be able to discuss decolonizing global health at a conference in partnership with the World Health Organization's Global Health Histories projects. I can't get enough of history, and I hope that that is the case for a lot of you also. The day after a World Health uh, Organization declaration of global emergency is a sensitive moment to discuss decolonizing global health. It's a moment we might almost find ourselves wanting, 
global health to put on its heroic mantle to rush in in full force on a helping mission. But we do not want that. We want it adorned by conceptual fearlessness, patience for open and sustained and humorous collaboration, empathy, and a humanistic curiosity. We want, it to re we want it to recognize that all human cultures are equally able to help themselves as long as the playing field is equal, and that equal does not mean same or even recognizably analogous, and that equal yet different playing fields have become more rare in a one-size-fits-all globalization model. We want a global health equipped with the uncomfortable awareness that yes, the empiricist Euro-American spirit of science may have exported around the globe an effective science to treat ill health, yet that same empiricist spirit of science has also contributed to exporting the ill health that fits the biomedicine, like hand in glove. A principle such as pasteurization by a brilliant Louis Pasteur cannot be cordoned off in the continuum ep epistemologically from a Western food industry that introduces metabolic and cardiovascular disease with stunning efficiency wherever it is granted e ingress. In the US, immigrants' mental health risk rises proportionately to time living in the US until it equals the dauntingly high psychiatric risk uh, of the US born. The millennial humility of global health looks nothing like the hubris of global health at the mid 20th century. There is every reason to seek expertise in decolonial thought and to be vigilant in excluding structural vestiges of the colonial civilizing mission. My own global health research relates to Haiti and I'll be talking about Haiti in two exemplary contexts. The first will be epidemiological and the second epistemological and, uh, and I will be attempting to show that the two are intertwined. First, cholera. There was something fable-like about the inability or unwillingness of the Western media in 2010 to see the urgent testimonials and then the protests of cholera-stricken communities along the banks of the Artibonite River in Mirbalé as anything other than hysterical and misinformed. After the first shock of seeing an epidemic emerge that the CDC had specifically counted out as a post-earthquake uh, possibility, the media settled into the comfortable default position that cholera must have been lurking in Haiti all along. The global south and the north stigma of low-resource, ultra-racialized Haiti made it all too easy to assume that Haiti was the incubator of yet another disease the West did not want to own. This had already occurred around the emergence of HIV AIDS with the ignominious and false 4-H's mnemonic, hemophiliacs, heroin addicts, homosexuals, and Haitians. But Haitian citizens around the center of the 2010 cholera outbreak were sure that there was a very concrete source for a new disease in their community the UN uh, peacekeeper barracks a little further up the banks of the Ar Artibonite River. One journalist only, fortunately the prodigiously talented Jonathan Katz, listened to them, investigated, and began publishing Associated Press articles on the proximity of the outbreak to visible and odorous faulty plumbing emissions leaking into the river from the barracks of soldiers from a region of the world in which cholera was active. Katz's articles quoted WHO Cholera Task Force uh, Claire Lys uh, Chenya as noting responsibly that, quote, there had not been a diagnosed case of cholera in Haiti as far back as records go in the mid-century. This kind of comment on the limits of knowledge was understood by the media writ large to mean simply that cholera had last been seen in Haiti several decades earlier. I was skeptical that cholera had ever been in Haiti if historically minded scholars of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries had never come across it in, in readings ranging from colonial medical reports to almanacs, journalism, government documents, memoirs, etc. And when I asked a range of Haitian colleagues, ranging from senior sociologists to vodou priests, they said, uh-uh, never heard of it in Haiti. 
Upon further direct re research, I found no trace of cholera reports, but a number of published comments in the 19th century about the startling absence of cholera in Haiti. So quoting Karl Marx's description of cholera as India's revenge upon the Western world, by which he clearly meant India's revenge on Western colonialism, I proposed in an op-ed that Haiti and cholera were strangers. Subsequent exhaustive research of 19th century journalism on cholera in the Caribbean, mostly in the form of ship captains' accounts of encounters with infected ports or attempts to avoid the same, allowed me and my colleague Victoria Zabo to map cholera outbreaks in several successive waves around uh, most of the Caribbean, but never Haiti, even though there had been a small amount of cholera as close as in the Dominican Republic on the same island. And yet there had been ample maritime commerce with international partners that we had confirmed. But this situation actually made sense. Haiti's expulsion of French colonial forces in late 1803 and its forcible, sustained, strategic abolition of enslavement, its enslavement, had been an epidemiological tour de force. Barracks living had ended. In the epidemics of 1832 and beyond, there were no colonial troops to bring cholera and spread it like wildfire in their close quarters, and there were no slave barracks to make that fire into a conflagration, a pattern exemplified uh, through late in the century in still colonized Cuba. Haiti's singular, risky, and costly self-emancipation had shifted the third point of the epidemic triangle composed of the pathogen, the agent causing infection, the host, the organism at risk of infection, and the environment, the setting where the infections occur. Colonial occupation and slavery were the ideal epidemic environment in the Caribbean, just as immigrants' tenement buildings and sweatshops were ideal environments in the US and Canadian establishment of cholera. This is a good reminder that legacies of colonialism can create material uh, infrastructural risks. Here, the literal architecture of inequality. And it's no accident that draft scandals in the 19th century in Europe sometimes use the language of buying a man to pay someone to replace a more fortunate conscript. The lowest military ranks were, somewhat like slaves, sacrificially deployed. Of course, what had motivated the former slaves of Haiti was a much bigger health achievement than avoiding a mere disease epidemic. As Walter Mignolo said, uh, disease is, is normal. They were avoiding the epidemic of death in the Middle Passage and the conditions of slavery in which nearly half of every brief generation of imported Africans had to be replaced due to the prodigious lethality of colonial enslavement itself. Context number two, decolonizing global science of the brain and mental health. This is a topic about the uh, epistemic nature of uh, empirical science in the late 19th century, which might seem less urgent than the above topic about cholera until you consider the atrocious human losses to distorted offshoots of empiricist science like eugenics and the multi-generational health toll of structural inequality in traditionally medically underserved communities marginalized by downstream effects of racial bias. Um, and although the cholera paradigm and the cognitive paradigm that I'm about to discuss may seem like two different worlds, my uh, work on a book project uh, on this topic uses Brazilian literary critic Roberto Schwartz's linkage of 19th century Euro-American liberal political economy, which favored positivist philosophy and privileged empirical science with slavery in the Americas, except in the outlier Haiti. And it's true that liberal political economy and slavery in the uh, Americas uh, were uh, compatible. I will map the outlines now of an epistemological rather than an epidemiological trajectory. It starts from 19th century Haitian intellectual Antenor Firmin's critique of, sorry, I think it's this. 
It's the keyboard? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. A uh, critique of early neuroscience in France, which at that time overlapped with a field we might call biological anthropology. And this harkens back to Carrie's comments about uh, uh, anthropology. It moves on to the subsequent creation in Haiti by his friend Jean Pricemars of an apparatus for the field of ethnology, uh, which began to really resemble the field of cultural anthropology. From there, it yielded the invention of comparative psychiatry or ethnopsychiatry by Pricemars' son, the neuropsychiatrist Louis Mars. Um, I would like to connect the dots from there to the decolonial psychiatry of uh, Martinican uh, psychiatrist Franz Fanon in Algeria and to Jamaican writer Sylvia Winter's paradigm of the extraterritoriality of self-cognition and to the neurophenomenology uh, of Varela and Maturana, but I will not have time to do so. Um, the book I'm currently writing about this follows this arc uh, to chart a genealogy of Caribbean and Latin American challenges to the epistemic brain in scientific modernity. Michel Foucault's use of the term episteme to describe a historical field of a priori that conditioned not only knowledge, but the very possibility of knowledge, aptly characterizes the emergence of Western brain science as Haitian intellectual Antenor Firmin encountered the field during his 1884 to 1885 fellowship year at the Parisian Society for Anthropology. This anthropological society, long directed by surgeon Pierre-Paul Broca of Broca's area fame, had a lasting preoccupation with research of differences among human brains and skulls to explain human uh, cultural and ethnic identities and divides. In the anthropological discourse of the time, it was the, the cranium ethnicum, the ethnic skull. Frequent recourse to surface or specious differences between white male European and other global demographics brains and skulls implicitly and explicitly contributed to a discourse of white cognitive supremacy. Although they granted Haitians an exceptional status for murky reasons linked to the conditions of coloniality the Haitians had experienced and to the brilliance of the Haitians that they happened to know, this foundation for their work prompted Firmin to write and publish his 1885 opus on the equality of the human races. Ostensibly contesting the inequality proposed by Gobineau in On the Inequality of the Human Races, in my reading, Firmin was more engaged with the legacies of Broca and the promise and problems of the emerging brain sciences. Firmin presented not just anthropological, but specifically phenomenological evidence of critical cognitive equality. It is natural, he queried, to have residing within the same learned, is it natural, he queried, to have residing um, <laughs> within the same learned society and in their same capacity as men of science, men that the science we supposedly represent appears to declare unequal. Um, Simple good sense, he wrote with understatement, inspired legitimate doubt. Uh, my analysis of his work begins by charting, um, actually I'm going to skip over this and just note that Firmin's uh, work um, alerts us to the risk of the brain in modernity functioning as a totem of exclusion for organic, expressive, performative, phenomenological equality. Um, okay, although Firmin's remaining life after the publication of his book was devoted to and destabilized by politics in Haiti, his work, uh, which reached deaf ears in Europe, had a resounding effect in Caribbean Pan-Africanist circles, and especially in the mind of his younger colleague, Jean Price Mars, um, uh, who subsequently to medical studies in Paris, established an academic faculty of ethnology in Port-au-Prince. And uh, that apparatus and his and his peers' connectedness with international intellectual circles facilitated the close connection of Haiti with the emergence of cultural anthropology, 
uh, not only through his anti-colonial work, but the field work of founding contributors such as Melville Herskovitz. Kaismar's son, Louis Mars, then did medical studies in Haiti, further, followed by further training in France, where he collaborated with French anthropologist Georges Devereux. Back in Haiti, he would publish the first book anywhere on comparative psychiatry, as confirmed by Devereux in the preface. Mars also coined the term ethnopsychiatry. Through his rich clinical and literary career, Dr. Mars theorized mental and neurological well-being in specifically cultural symbiosis, unfolding as ethnodrama in ritual, letters, arts, and daily life. Ethnopsychiatry as conceptualized by Mars is a little recognized yet pioneering forerunner to today's fields of cultural psychiatry and global health psychiatry. In its insistence on the validity of uh, communicative, communitarian, religious, and cultural responsiveness to psychological disequilibrium, Haitian ethnopsychiatry is also a legacy of Firmin's work on cognition and equality. Yet Mars's work later went in a bizarre direction when dictator Francois Duvalier paired him up with psychopharmacological innovator uh, Nathan Klein for the founding of the Mars and Klein Psychiatric Hospital in Haiti. Uh, a partner in Smith, Klein, and French, uh, Nathan Klein was a forerunner in the use of uh, chlorpromazine, reserpine, uh, and lithium, among other drugs. Klein found a successful approach for persuading Duvalier uh, to uh, provide a subvention, a subvention for the proposed psychiatric center by international uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, he and uh, Mars had the utopian project for this to be the first hospital in the world to rely on outpatient uh, and pharmacological care rather than hospitalization. However, it subsequent, this utopian betrothal between big pharma and anti-asylum critiques of institutions like asylums uh, quickly became a disturbing um, uh, pharmacological zone of experimentation and ended with uh, Mars having uh, completely distanced himself from the project and Klein flaring out with the dubious adventure of sending Harvard ethnobotany student Wade Davis to research the ethnobotanical -bot recipe for the zombie. So I will just conclude by saying that by the time of the earthquake of 2010, the World Health uh, Report Literature Review on Culture and Mental Health in Haiti made no mention of Louis Mars or any of his mentors and associates. Uh, and yet Mars's writings remain deeply useful for con conceptualizing the decolonization of global mental health. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Sanjoy Bhattacharya, who is a professor of history at, um, at the University of York and also the director of the Collaborating Center for Global Health Histories, um, who's one of, one of our um, co-organizers. He unfortunately could not make it in in person, so he'll be joining us via Zoom. And uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, if you can just tell us when to advance the slides, it'd be good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, apologies for not being able to be there. I'm, I'm absolutely gutted not to be able to meet all the wonderful students who have made this possible and also to be able to meet people whose work I know for many years. Uh, and Carrie, who I met in the UK quite accidentally last summer and who's done an enormous amount of work for this project. So, thank you all. Um, could we move to the first slide, please? Okay. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to take the focus uh, away uh, uh, from countries uh, for a moment and talk about the World Health Organization itself. Now, um, formally, uh, the WHO was up, up and running uh, on the 7th of April, 1948, through a headquarters in Geneva, in Switzerland. But it took uh, years of meetings and conferences, uh, many of which were closed door, confidential, uh, to set this new organization up. Um, and, and, and 
what is often forgotten by what I would call a colonized historiography is that nationalist governments uh, invading uh, in countries like India and Egypt were actually part of these negotiations, uh, not just as observers, but as active contributors. And this was actually politically important when the WHO uh, is up and running in April 48. And it's important because a country uh, like India pushes for regionalization of the WHO. What that basically means is that a newly emerged country uh, which had uh, unchained itself from colonialism uh, uh, was arguing that uh, the new world health organization needed to be different from the old League of Nations health section uh, headquartered also in Geneva and, and to be different uh, the new WHO needed to have regional offices. And the rationale given for these new regional offices was that countries in each of these regions, uh, which were politically defined, uh, um, would have a bigger say in how the new World Health Organization worked in, 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 in each region. So, in 1948 itself, the WHO Regional Office for Southeast Asia was created with its capital in New Delhi. Um, um, uh, and, and what is fascinating, if you look at the legal paperwork surrounding the setting up of uh, WHO Southeast Asia, is that it was made legally answerable to a regional committee. So from the very beginning, the political negotiations led by India, but also involving Sri Lanka and Burma, um, were to ensure that, that uh, the WH headquarters in Geneva would have limited control over what countries could do in that region. What is also fascinating is after the first regional committee meeting is held and then uh, uh, decision, decisions are taken, WHO CRO comes up with very specific priorities about what needed to be uh, done in the region for the region and in this way demonstrated significant autonomy uh, uh, in relation to the WHO headquarters. To me what is also fascinating is that the member states in this region were very active and collaborative in the annual World Health Assembly meetings, which were initially not just held in Geneva, but also in countries like the United States and later in India. They were basically coalitions of voting patterns coming up where newly independent countries would get together and vote in certain programs um, uh, that were not necessarily considered as important within the WHO headquarters. Could we have the next slide, please? So the question then remains, is it worth decolonizing this history? And according to me, yes, it is. Because I think far too many scholars, whether they're historians, social scientists, perhaps even critical global health uh, uh, an analysts who who, who make extremely strong and valid points about criticizing uh, global health as it's configured today, often equate the WHO with its headquarters. Now, there were some director generals who tried to centralize power, Black and Dow, uh, the second WHO director general, and I think it's fair to say that he failed in the effort to centralize all power in Geneva. If he, if, if he had succeeded, maybe the malaria eradication program would have looked different. Uh, someone like Havdan Mala actively decentralized power, uh, uh, which won him a lot of friends in the regional offices, but which also left a deep imprint in the way the smallpox eradication program, which we'll talk about later, uh, sort of panned out. So we have to recognize that the WHO as it exists from 1948 onwards represents a very specific historical moment. It's a moment of anti-imperialism, 
where several countries are coming together to say never again will we work in a way where a small number of countries working from within an organizational organization like the WHO will exploit other countries. And CRO, the Southeast Asia Regional Office, takes a lead on this with a strong regional director, Dr. Chandamani, an ex-British Army medical doctor, but who gets real political backing from two political heavyweights. Uh, India's first health minister, uh, Amrit Kaur, and India's first prime minister, come foreign minister, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Now, what this group of people are able to do is to create a new international alliance and regional funding for projects, which means that Geneva also loses control over how projects are planned and delivered. Some projects are negotiated, like TB. Uh, Madhupai is there. Um, he can perhaps tell us more about it. But if you look at Niels Brindis's fantastic new book, Languished Hopes, there were all these ideas and agenda setting in, in the centers of power. But the moment the policies actually hit India, they hit the buffer because politics and local infrastructural problems made sure that the policy had to be readapted. So we have to look at regional level activity to understand that there is a formal, legal, legally enshrined uh, devolution of power, which scholars often don't study. So when they critique the WHO, in many ways the critique becomes simplistic because it's only targeted at initiatives and ideas and agenda setting that is coming from Geneva, when actually the agenda setting I agree that certain countries are involved in pushing agendas with their monetary clout, but that agenda setting is being done from across regions. And we have to understand that if we have to weaken or stand up to such power. So could we move to the next slide, please? So let me take smallpox as an example, because you know it is uh, the story that comes up again and again as a success story for 20th century global health. Now, it's often forget, forgotten that smallpox control and elimination was a priority for the WHO Sierra nations. And in fact, they're the ones who put it on the agenda in the first World Health Assembly. If you look at a uh, history of smallpox eradication, generally, this rather important point becomes inconvenient and gets pushed onto the side. Why? Because depending on which institution you're learning that history of smallpox eradication from, their interest and their involvement seems to define when the smallpox eradication program starts. So for example, if you look at the US Centers for Disease Control history of smallpox eradication, it only starts when CDC gets involved in the mid 60s in Western and Central Africa. Nothing existed before that, but that is not true because from 1948, if you look at what's happening at the regional level, you look at the pressures that are coming from the WHO regional level to the headquarters, you realize that smallpox is a priority uh, from the very beginning. What is also fascinating is when the Soviet Union makes a call for smallpox eradication in 1957, it is the newly independent countries that rally behind uh, the USSR and make sure that the resolution is passed. Not only do they make sure the resolution is passed, they then collaborate uh, with Soviet negotiators across the Southeast Asia region to ensure that vast stocks of Soviet vaccine are brought in, used, and the disease beaten back to a significant degree. Now, why is this important? It is important because all this is happening between 1957 and 1965. And if you look at why in 1966 and 67, there is an agreement that smallpox eradication should be intensified and taken to the next level, it's not because of uh, your CDC 
uh, successes in Western Central Africa, but in South Asia, which is the biggest reservoir for smallpox in the world, that decision is to, to intensify the program is made on the basis that successes had already taken place through regional and South-South cooperation internationally, uh, uh, with often with the help of Soviet vaccine, which had shown local political leaders that just perhaps smallpox eradication was possible. So your CDC successes in Africa, to use Madhu's wonderful model, managed to rally support for smallpox eradication in Geneva, and perhaps in Washington, and perhaps in New York. But in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in the Western Pacific, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, with its headquarters first in Alexandria and then in Cairo, the decision to support the intensification of smallpox eradication seems to have been largely mobilized on the basis of ground level successes for about 10 years on the ground in these two regions. So it's very important to, I think, decenter these headquarters away from what happens on the ground for it's a rich history of political autonomy and exchange that is often forgotten in existing scholarship. So we have the next slide, please. So then I ask you, where does the problem lie? So I would suggest to you, the problem doesn't really lie in the historical record because a lot of this information exists in a diversity of archives, libraries, and collections of private papers. During my research, I found that even if some WHO files had been shedded to create an archive that presented a certain story, a certain historical narrative of what happened in relation to smallpox eradication, the empire of bureaucracy that health ministries often are in collaboration with WHO partners meant that copies of those files could often be found in regional office archives or national archives. And I think it's, and also private papers, as many people were very proud to be part of the smallpox eradication program, they kept their files. So you can actually, uh, as has been discussed before, uncover the silences that are created through archives. And some of the smallpox eradication archives that we now see coming up, the online archives, are, uh, I would say, very, very measured attempts to silence as many voices in order to ensure that a small number of voices are empowered and heard and seen as a, a source of success for global health, not just smallpox eradication, because that success story has justified so much from polio eradication to almost every challenge, even the last Ebola outbreak. We had a wonderful speaker at the start of this panel about Ebola, but when you uh, heard about containment uh, and vaccination, uh, the language that was used to justify was the history of smallpox eradication. So smallpox eradication and the success is a very, very powerful tool in global health to this day. So the problem therefore lies in where we look for evidence. The problem often lies in us scholars, because if we have decided that a small number of people matter, and a small number of voices matter, and only what is said in English matters, then we are automatically focusing our attention to a very limited archive when actually a much wider archive exists. So for me, I repeat, the problem lies often in the scholarly gaze. Often the scholarly gaze is multilingual, but because we attribute power to people sitting in London, Geneva, Washington, New York, we often only look for major actors there. And then when we look at low and middle income countries or emerging economies or, or, or poorer developing economies, we only look at those voices of people who are talking to whom we consider to be the main actors. So we have to get away from narratives of top-down imposition and assume that only a small number of people mattered. 
we need to look for evidence of decolonized research and reporting that does exist. So why not use it? Can we go to the next slide, please? So how do we decolonize such research? I think first step, do not assume that the WHO is the WHO headquarters. Never was the case in 48, isn't the case now. We have to study regionalization. We have to study actual impact on regionalize, of regionalization on the member states, but also how the member states have an impact on the WHO because of the power uh, structures created by regional offices. We have to look at the legal frameworks for regional autonomy. It has boring detail, but that boring detail matters. If the WHO headquarters really was in control of the entire organization, how is it that every global health program that has been advocated by the WHO from Geneva has been changed so fundamentally by so many actors and so often. We have therefore as scholars, as critical scholars to read and compare WHO headquarters and regional reporting. And we can do this, not just by focusing on published reports and deconstructing published reports, we have to go into the raw material. We have to look at how massive reports become smaller reports. We have to understand what is being left out and why, what the politics there is. We have to look at translations. Often a lot of the reports that are presented by the WHO at the World Health Assembly are based on numerous larger reports, many of which have been provided by field workers not writing in English. The act of translation itself can create silences. We have to study field reports in the original languages look at how they're being translated at regional level, look at the silences created through translation, and then also look at how those translations are then quoted selectively at the headquarters level, something I call lost in translation in my process. It's very, very important and very, very useful. Therefore, I think that we can decolonize such research about global health by studying complexities of impl implementation. In this way, we can recover voices, experience, and contributions of many more people in global health pro programs than we usually study. Also important, I think, is to examine all sorts of funding. I think Madhu raises a very important point about who controls money and who distributes it and what power it accords people. True, I completely agree with this. But if we also recognize the fact that nations themselves are giving a lot of money, both at regional level, but investing in national programs, whose agendas may have been set elsewhere in the high income countries, if you will, then you would get a very different picture of, 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 of whose money is doing what. So if you again take the smallpox eradication program case study, and we start talking about national contributions in terms of staff time, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of national workers whose salaries are often not reported as being a contributory factor to the success of a program. There is no accounting of nationally produced vaccination and its costs to, to the overall budget that made success possible. So we also are creating an artificial history of aid dependence and creating silences, therefore, of, uh, of national contributions to international collaborations and health, or what we now call global health. I, I for one, don't believe one has followed the other. I think international health continues and global health continues. There are some crossovers, but luckily international health can still exist and might be the main way to make sure that global health ambitions are kept in check because 
the international uh, powers, the international collaborations will have the necessary political clout to call those who run global health agendas to account. And you can see that in the way uh, many global health organizations are trying to create extremely good relations with the heads of states of various emerging economies who actually play a very important role in creating international uh, coalitions. The idea being is to take, I think, these leaders away from international coalitions and bring them closer to global health coalitions. That international health certainly uh, remains relevant. I, I don't believe in, 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 in a sort of linear step-by-step -step process. So studying the boring money flows helps, uh, and, 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 and I'm going to stop there because I've seen a wonderful sign telling me to stop. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that image has been very carefully chosen. Um, I've searched through my very big collection of smallpox eradication pictures to show you that there were local actors in smallpox eradication. Thank you very much. So next we have Dr. Alicia Mirage Bess. She's a mixed method scientist in the Behavioral Epidemiological and Clinical Sciences Division at FHI 360. So welcome, Alicia. Okay, my check in the back. Can you all hear me? Cool. I hear you, you will hear me, I promise. Okay. So first off, I'd like to thank my little sisters, Laura and Yavu, for inviting me to speak today. And I want to offer to you all just some reflections on things that I have seen in my 14 years as a researcher. And my lens now that I sit through is as an academic trained but nonprofit based scientist. So I am based at FHI 360, which some of you might know as Family Health International. We FHI! Yes! Air 5! Okay. And I'm also adjunct faculty in the George Washington Milken Institute School of Public Health. So I want to offer for you all today some reflections for the students in the room, for fellow faculty, for scientists. It, it's kind of all of those lenses that I'm looking through. And to acknowledge those lenses, I am a social behavioral scientist. I do a lot of mixed methods research. The vast majority of my work has been in HIV, but in clinical settings. A lot on the treatment adherence, medication adherence side for older African Americans living with HIV, also dealing with substance use and mental illness. Recently, my work has involved a lot more younger folks and also sexual gender minorities, LGBT folks, transgender individuals, still mostly communities of color. And so I've looked at that care continuum pretty much the whole way through from prevention to treatment and really trying to engage communities in equitable processes and community-based participatory processes. And so my academic training is very typical, bachelor's and master's, PhD, postdoc. And so I like to tell people that I speak four languages, English, Jamaican Patois, Spanish, and physician. And so a lot of what I've seen is what happens when we've got these really ambitious clinical outcomes we want to promote, and we want to do it in a way that has lasting change and effects, but we aren't really grappling with some of those processes that can get us there. So that's kind of some orientation I want to give. Okay. This has been touched on literally in our last presentation throughout our entire panel, but I think it bears repeating. The language, the terminology, the words that we use really, really matter. Just, I know when I started my public health training, international health was all I really heard about. And as a Miami native, so a US-based American global citizen, I found it hard to see myself and how the work that I could contribute fit into an international health lens. Recently, I've heard a little bit more conversation around global health, and I think that that framing matters. It, it helps to allow students who are maybe doing domestic-facing work, who want to maybe have a, a foot in both domestic-facing and other contexts, to see themselves a little bit more. And I actually think that this, this conversation around words is important when we think about something I study a lot, which is stigma and how when we are going into communities, contexts, cultures, situations where we're unfamiliar, that we're stigmatizing unintentionally, and it's very problematic. And sometimes it's promoting those colonizer mentalities and structures. So for instance, I work on a project right here in Durham looking at HIV prevention for youth, youth of color predominantly. 
And we had really lofty goals, everyone. We thought we were going to come in and say, OK, what are your educational needs around PrEP? I think someone even used that acronym, by the way. And it was, what is PrEP, right? And then another question was, what do you mean by HIV? Like, I've heard of it. I know people that have it. But what is it? And we had to figure out, OK, we thought we were at one part in this process. We have to go back. And I remember we, we brought a really well-known, very popular handout. It's called PrEP 101, I think. And we gave it to some of the folks who had asked us those questions. And I kid you not, everyone, one of the first lines on this thing says, high risk. And people stopped reading right there. They took issue with risk. What makes me high risk? I don't know what those words mean. I don't really appreciate them. I think they're stigmatizing. So that's just an example. And I've had many others in my career where we, are, we have the best of intentions. We're not doing the work to really grapple with the words we use and what they mean. Another example, people first language, persons who inject drugs. I work with many clinicians that just don't even understand what I'm saying when I say, can you please stop saying injection drug users? So like, we're, we're saying the same thing. And I'm saying, no, we're taking the behavior away from the person and just talking about a particular attribute and only one. So these are just examples of some of the things we have to think about and stop trying to unintentionally reinforce some stigmatizing mentality around. OK. So I actually don't have a ton of slides. So I hope that I will stay on time for that reason. So another thing I think is really important in thinking about lessons learned from a US perspective and implications around global health is learning from shared successes. So I'm going to go and speak again from work that I do in HIV stigma. It's everywhere now. Anyone who has done HIV research knows it's a huge buzzword. It's in a lot of what we talk about and study and discuss now. And that's a good thing. But it needs to be a thoughtful thing too, right? So BMC, I think it was BMC Public Health last year, had a huge spread looking at new frameworks of intersectional stigma, the idea that we have reinforcing and, and multiple forms of stigmatized identities that affect our health. And if we look at the recently begun um, ending the epidemic plan, there are actually some state initiatives right here in North Carolina and other states where they're trying to bring stigma training into what they're doing at the state level. And that's incredible. It's really, really great. But we have to own that there's still a lot we don't know about how to measure stigma, how to intervene upon it, and how to look at it over time. And so speaking from a US-based perspective, as I said, a lot of the communities I work in are communities of color. And the vast majority of my work was with older African Americans living with HIV. We don't really have a ton of really well-evaluated, evidence-based stigma reduction interventions that have been effective in this community, in this country, for that population. We don't really have a lot of examples of that. But we have seen structural, multi-level stigma reduction interventions that were successful in Sub-Saharan Africa with mother-to-child PMTCT types of um, outcomes, with maternal health, child health, adolescent health outcomes. So let's learn. Let's have much more explicit conversation about how we learn from these other contexts, how we implement, how we evaluate, and how we translate. And I want to say that there's definitely some conversation happening around this. And I was in a meeting last week held by RTI about stigma, stigma training institutions, stigma um, research opportunities. And one of the things they talked about was long-term and short-term drivers of stigma, and that it's really incumbent upon us to, culture, to, to create a culture of stigma that's looking beyond the lens of one illness. And that's what intersectional stigma is. That's what intersectionality is. And it's worth it to keep having those conversations around that. OK. So I want to talk a little bit about some power structures Alicia has dealt with that I'm sure some folks in the room might relate to as well. So it's important that as students, as scientists, as researchers, and as professors, we think about the fact that we hold a lot of power when we go into a community that we wish to work with. And sometimes that power looks different if we identify as a person of color or as some of those underserved or marginalized communities. But that does not mean that it's best to tokenize and to then assume that if I am a scientist of color and I'm going into a community of color, well, I know what's going on. I'm going to fix it because I get it. It's a start. And that's where we get into that, 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 that grappling of inclusion and diversity and equity. 
But when it's done poorly, it's done really badly, and it's very detrimental. And so I'll give you an example of experiences I've had. So I am the child of immigrants. I'm from Miami, Florida. My parents are from Jamaica, so I'm a very proud Jamaican American. I am also, because I'm from Miami, a native Spanish speaker. And so I've absolutely had people ask me, well, you speak Spanish. Can you, can you speak to this issue around Hispanic Latino issues or Latinx issues? And I'm thinking, no. What? How dare you? No, that, that's not OK at all. And I, you have to own that. And so it's harder for me as a junior scientist, as a young person, to be able to say, I really think that's an inappropriate question, and here's why. But I'll tell you, I keep doing it, because I don't see any other way to, to get where I'm going and to do it in a, in a fair way. I also don't relate to every experience of an African American, because that's not my culture. So I have to own that, too. And I will tell you all, <laughs> they can tell. So when I go into African American communities, yes, I identify as a black woman. My grandmother doesn't know what African American means. But to this day, she does not understand that term. I, just for laughs, I'll ask her about it. But the point is that. Because I am a scientist of color, I'm a woman of color, and I'm a young person that's talking about these issues with adolescents, with folks who are older, it lets me ask some of these questions very directly, such as these. What's the legacy of research that this community is dealing with that maybe I relate to, maybe I understand, but that I have to acknowledge? Is there any relation between me and this community? How do I reflect on that? How can I be reflexive of it? How can I be thoughtful about it? Who are the decision makers? Who's the team? If we're thinking about community-based approaches and equity, am I going to decide when we have to change something, or are you? When we sent out that PrEP 101 handout and high risk was a no-go, oh, we took that thing back immediately. Sorry, guys. Pretend you did not see it. They're the decision makers. It's their informational needs. It's them who we're trying to convince to take PrEP. It's not your job to tell them, well, actually, you are high risk, and here's why. We're going to have to find a shared language. I'm not going to convince you that you're supposed to be OK with the word risk, right? And Another thing I want to mention really briefly, because I've had a lot of people ask me, why is it that you work in domestic facing stuff? Why are you at a nonprofit instead of an institution? Because to communities have actually given me less mistrust and I don't how do I say a little bit more trust because I don't say at an academic institution, no offense guys. I'm all about Hopkins. I did my postdoc at Harvard. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm simply saying when I get to take what the work I do is and means and what it's supposed to accomplish out of the context of historical trauma that a lot of academic institutions have perpetuated, yeah, I get a little further. Maybe they slam the door a little bit slower. And I think that that's worth it, especially when you're a young scientist. And like I said, when you're thinking about equity across the process, how are you going to navigate that mistrust? You can't ignore it. And when we have biobehavioral interventions and structural interventions fall down, it's because we were trying to ignore it. So I, I think those are just the questions we're asking around power structures. Funding mechanisms. OK, so especially when you're a young scientist and you're writing your heart out with grants and things, it's actually very hard to frame why community-based approaches are so important. And it's partly because it's a long, tough, draining process. And almost every funder wants to see a health outcome that you're intervening upon. They want to see short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals and outcomes. They want to see your SMART objectives. They want to see logic models, inputs, and outputs, all of that jargon. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But there is a shift now. There are some funders that are OK with you saying, the goal of this is to actually put together a community stakeholder advisory board to look at different sectors, different types of experts and stakeholders, and then inform future processes. One example is PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. They have multiple stakeholder engagement grants specifically around these types of processes. That's progress. That's a big deal. Another thing that I think is helpful and worth acknowledging it's not the most equitable thing in the world that our students are unpaid interns on a lot of our studies. I know I'm shouting preaching to the crowd, right? That was me. I get it. That's also what happens sometimes when we work in country on projects that are funded in other countries. I'm not saying we can overtone those structures immediately. What I'm saying is there are still ways we can build in equity principles. Bringing those individuals in on papers, having them lead papers, training them in research. Our project that I talked about that's right here in Durham, adolescents run our focus groups. They are being trained to be data collection coordinators if they so choose. It becomes something they can put on their resume that they know how to do. We have had many adolescents say, I would have never thought about a career as a researcher, but I actually like facilitating focus groups. I think it's a great skill. I'm glad I learned this. That's an equity-based approach. That's something that we can do. That's 
actually quite cost effective. So there's ways we can grapple with this. Another thing about shaping funding priorities that I want to mention is that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a culture of health. They are specifically interested in stigma research lately. They're also very interested, I think they had a call last year, for proposals looking at how to translate interventions from other contexts and countries here in the US. So again, this is a funder shaping a lot of what the opportunities look like, but it's because they're hearing it from the field. NIH, if anyone's ever heard of RFI as a request for information, when you submit those, those often translate to RFAs, actual funding opportunities. I myself had that experience as a postdoc. I wrote a request for information that became an RFA a few years later. Like, there are definitely ways we can grapple with the priorities of funders and start to shape that a little bit more. So here's my last slide. Perfect. Okay. So. I want to leave you all with a global health equity framework that I recently came across in work that I do at FHI 360. And I'm grateful because FHI 360 is expanding more of its domestic footprint. I think it's known much more for its international work. But we're having these conversations right now. We're doing this work right now. And if you all take a look at those processes, those terms that are up there, hold them in your mind, OK? These are the principles of community-based participatory research. We are literally saying the same thing and using different terms to do so. What we call global health, what we call community health and CBPR, they're literally just parts of the same. It's a continuum of the same type of principles and approaches. And that's worth remembering, too. Thank you. Our final speaker is Dr. Shea Abimbola who is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney and is also the editor-in-chief at BMJ Global Health. So welcome. Okay, so it's been a great day listening to everyone speak. And it's a, um, uh, an unenviable task to be the person to go last. And I knew that I was going to speak last. And I wondered what it was that I would have to say that no one else had talked about. Um, and in thinking that, I recognized primarily that I was invited here um, in part because I edit a global health journal. Um, and it's a British medical journal, global health journal. And I'm sure that at some level in your mind, you are thinking right now that that's quite strange. I'm an African, I grew up in Nigeria. I'm an academic, I went to medical school. Um, and somehow, strangely, um, I have this task of running the Global Health Journal. And that comes with, with complexities in my mind. Um, I try to process what that means um, for me to run a Global Health Journal um, and what Global Health then means for me. And at some point in my mind, I, I know that it, it meant something different to what it would have meant for many other people, especially the kinds of people who would otherwise have occupied the position that I occupy. So I've struggled a lot to, to, to make it make sense for me. And in, in the spirit of decolonization, I've also struggled a lot to make that word make sense for me. Um, global health, decolonization are not simple terms. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about are the complexities that I encounter as a person inside my own mind. So I'm sort of opening my mind to you guys. Um, and how I struggle and I continue to struggle to process that, um, given who I am and given the role that I have. Now, more specifically, I'm sure that I was asked to speak on this, on this thing, um, in part because the journal has been running a series of papers that have been challenging the status quo in global health. And some of that have been around authorship and what it means um, for decolonizing global health, what it means for equity. And several of the papers that Madhu um, talked about in the morning um, were published in BMJ Global Health, and I edited them, and I wrote one of them. And the reason why I have been engaged in this conversation is in part because I'm aware that it's very easy for us to have very superficial conversations about these things. It's very easy to, have, to gather in a place like this and go back home and life continues as it is, which I think is the norm for this kind of, of, of event. And I'm afraid as well that it's very likely that we would end up just turning decolonization into a buzzword 
and it would lose its meaning and its force. And for me, I've been asking myself, what can I possibly do to avoid that? As a general editor, as an academic, as someone who is in a position to speak to you today. So first, I think, I, I, I'm, I, I've thought through three sets of concrete actions or framings, um, which are always in the fore in my mind, one of which is who holds knowledge and whose knowledge is, is valued. Now, several speakers have spoken to this all, all through the day um, about the ways in which we discount local knowledge, often tacit knowledge, and how we need to rethink how we relate with knowledge. The second is how we relate to what colonization means, right? Um, we are often um, Western-facing, foreign-facing in our analysis and thinking about colonization, and it's very easy to forget that different forms of colonization existed before the West arrived at many countries, and that those forms of colonization have continued. And it's important to, to include that thinking in our conversations about decolonization. And the third is um, about whose voice, um, who has a right to speak to these issues, and how do we determine that? Um, and and, and is, is voice zero sum? In other words, if I speak, can you speak to? And again, what do we do with that? And, and, frankly, it is what do I, as an editor, do with that? But hopefully, you can recognize yourself in my struggles. So again, it's been covered a lot today about global health not just being what happens between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries, right? Um, global health also happens within low- and middle-income countries. And sort of equities and inequities we are struggling with exist in high-income countries like this, right? And when you, when, you, when you recognize that, and you recognize what leads to progress in global health, um, you know very well that there are often very local processes that are embedded in local politics and local knowledge exchange. Um, and if you study the history of, of global health and inequities in global health, it becomes very clear that when we say we don't know what we need to do, when we plead ignorance, we are lying. Right? That in many instances, we understand or we should, if we're looking in the right places, where the problems lie and how to address them. Um, there was a friend of mine who submitted a paper. I'm going to talk about papers who submitted to my journal through, through this. Um, submitted a paper to my journal um, saying um, that we don't know how to organize primary health care. And it got me thinking, what, what did this person mean by we? Right? And, and there's a lot of questions about we through this presentation as well. When we say we, what do we mean? Who is this person to, dis to, 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 to declare that we do not know what many people know, right? And in many introduction segments of many manuscripts, you find people claiming ignorance. Um, I, I, and it, it bothers me that, we, that that is possible, right? Um, and as an editor, it, I can't at every instance put, put people up on this. Sometimes I do. But it's a struggle. I would do nothing else if I was to focus on correcting people's language all the time. And another colleague of mine um, said that high-income countries um, are the primary funders and generators of knowledge on health systems. Again, a kind of knowledge published in a certain kind of place. But I would argue that this is not the most consequential kind of knowledge. And we need to shift our gaze in how we appreciate and think about what knowledge is and what knowledge matters. And what does it then mean to decolonize the literature? Um, when I receive a manuscript, I often ask myself, for whom is this author writing? Is it, are they writing for people who are particularly affected by this issue? Or are they writing for an imagined foreign, foreign audience? How have they imagined that change happens in global health? Again, in many instances, there's an assumption that you can just parachute change into a system, right? Uh, and uh, I'm using a, a framing by C.S. Lewis here who describes surgical and organic change. We are often to taken by the kinds of change that you could introduce into a system. So we are obsessed with interventions, whereas systems have a logic. Societies have a logic. And often there's an internal process that we need to understand before we can make change happen. And often we ignore those 
to our own peril and of course to the disadvantage of those we may be seeking to help. I have recently been particularly interested in the, in the ways in which we can access the kinds of local knowledge that I talk about. Right. Um, local newspapers, local blogs, radios, message groups, and minutes of meetings. Right. Um, so in, in a lot of my work with, with some of my PhD students and in my PhD as well, um, several years ago, I was exploring the different kinds of knowledge and the spaces in which you could identify knowledge. Right. Um, and I wish that in our efforts to decolonize global health, we start to really take seriously so this informal kinds of knowledge and synthesize them. I would like, for example, to see systematic review on primary health care that, for example, takes into account um, the minutes of meetings of community health committees or that takes into account what district health managers discuss on a week-to-week -week basis. Because we are not looking at those places for, to understand and for knowledge, we are often just laboring in vain. And you can see that again and again in literature that people focus on very strange, very thin, very unrepresentative sources of knowledge. In the journal as well, I've been seeking very actively to, to raise the profile of a kind of manuscript that I will describe as practice papers. I think in, in our understanding of what knowledge is, we also overvalue research. We overvalue research papers. And I really wish that we would start to refocus our attention on what I call practice papers, what people learn in their day-to-day -day work. It's often more important than what you study by collecting data over three, four months. Now, to my second issue around um, British colonization. In many low and income countries, um, it's important to recognize that there are layers of colonization, right? And that those layers often matter for inequities in health. Now, often in, in primary health care, and I'm sure Sanjoy knows a lot about this, we describe the basic unit of governing health systems as a district health system. Often, I've hardly seen people talk about clearly how even our idea of district was a colonial idea, right? It was the, the basic unit of colonial extraction. And they were created by disrupting existing governance mechanisms within systems. And those mechanisms are not all equitable, of course. So you, you put a clearly extractive, unequitable system on top of a previous one, and you amplify the mess, right? and the mess persists. And, and I'm really interested, for example, in, in advancing our conversations around decolonization to really study um, these kinds of ways in which colonization disrupted local governance mechanisms in, in, and how those affect inequities in health within countries. And also it's important to remember, um, and we often forget this, that languages like Hindi or Mandarin are themselves colonizing languages, right? Um, and it's all well and good to, to open up, and I really want us to open up the, the, the space, uh, that academic literature, literature space, to have more languages. But in our advocacy, it's important to be clear-minded about what we mean by colonization, <laughs> that it's not something peculiar to the West, and to not unnecessarily overvalue the power of the West. Of course, we know that all forms of colonization are evil, and some are evil than others, and I would argue that the Western form was particularly evil because it disrupted existing systems. However, we must also have at the back of our mind that systems are complex, colonization is not simple, and we should not pretend that it is. Um, and we often hear, uh, sorry, we, we hardly hear um, ha what happens um, in colonial encounters, post-independence. Post and I'll give an example that bothers me a lot. So when people talk about how the World Bank and IMF disrupted and destroyed health systems in LMICs, I've hardly ever heard anyone talk about what policymakers in those countries were thinking and doing. And what were those systems in place that allowed them to, to do, that allowed the IMF and World Bank to do what they did. Right? It's, it, 
we should avoid, and, and I'm, I, I try to, and I hope that you will avoid, um, this simplification of history. Right? LMIC people are not any morally superior to other people. Right? And it's important to understand that, that there are strands of inequities and there are strands of efforts to address them. Um, but it's important to understand and look at the world with very, very clear eyes. Um, yeah. And to, to my third point about who, who has the right to speak. Now, as an editor, I often get challenged um, about the kind of platform um, that I have and how to use it. And in many instances, um, people want to exclude certain kinds of voices from certain kinds of conversations. But again, if we understand how colonization works and how dispossession and disadvantage works, it becomes clear that, that an Indian academic who is privileged, even though they have a brown skin, could be colonized as themselves or could have their privilege to stem from that. So, so when you see privileged people in privileged circles exchanging privileged positions, I'm skeptical. Right? If, if, for example, and this has happened, um, this something has happened, um, a, um, a privileged LMIC person says that a privileged white person should not talk. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, I, I know you are privileged. Right? I would rather that a non-privileged LMIC person speak. Often the ways in which we, we, we take space, right, and we organize space in, in our discussions around decolonization and, and around global health, uh, privileges the privileged. And the privileged can be from anywhere. And it's important to recognize that in the ways in which we try to say someone should speak or not speak. Instead, what, I, what, my, what my approach has been is to say, I will judge you, or I would assess your work based on what you have to say. Because it's hard for me to determine who is privileged by the color of their skin or by where they live. Um, and that, that, that couldn't possibly be the key to their worldview. In addition, I often find that the ways in which you discuss decolonization we are often privileging platforms that are global, right? So if, if someone is saying, um, um, uh, we want to decolonize global health, and they are speaking on, a, on an American platform, it's all well and good to claim space on an American platform or on, on a Western platform. But I'm also interested in ways in which we create platforms, right, within LMICs, in which we can have these conversations that are no less difficult about decolonization. That there are processes going on within our countries that are very akin to, to colonization, and we have to find a way to address those kinds of processes. We have to find platforms that allow us to discuss those processes in the same breath, with the same stridency as we address the Western colonization and the foreign gaze to which we often speak in our conversations about decolonization. So in summary, um, we need to work towards reforming the knowledge systems that we have. We need to take all kinds of colonization seriously. And in our conversations about the colonization, we have to take all of those seriously as well. And we have to resist very simple um, dichotomies between people. We have to understand that the origins uh, of, of, of inequalities and the systems that perpetuate inequalities are often not um, black or white. They are often both. Thank you very much. Oh, here. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A session for our second panel. And so I'm going to invite the audience to, if there's anyone in the audience would like to come ask a question of any of the four speakers that you just heard. Dr. McMurray, I am a nurse at UNC, and I'm also a graduate student. And my question is about the utilization of um, community health workers in, the, in the, our attempts to decolonize global health, um, being that there are programs uh, that kind of focus on having people who are local uh, as the forefront and being a part of 
opening access to care and education. How can we promote more use of this? I know that there are some states who have adopted community health workers in their public health programs. Um, it's really taken off internationally. How can we use that as a way to kind of change the face of what decolonizing um, global health looks like? Thank you for a great question. I'll jump in and I invite others to as well. So I think that there's a couple of things that, that I touched on in my talk that speak to your question that's really important about how we're engaging community health workers. So I know in some of the projects I've seen at Johns Hopkins and some of the projects that I've seen around here, there's actually quite a bit of, of interest on the funding side for use of community health workers as a way to engage communities that are traditionally underserved or maybe, you know, healthcare mistrustful. I think I just saw an NIH RFA a couple days ago that was about strengthening the HIV care continuum through the use of community health workers. So first and foremost, I think that speaks to, to shaping those funding priorities and how important it is to have those equity principles from that lens. The other thing I want to throw out there I think speaks to what I talked about with um, how to make the process beneficial and equitable to those community health workers themselves. I think that goes back to grappling with tokenism and making sure that we don't think that because we have a community health worker that's from the neighborhood or community we're trying to go to, that they know everything about the issues. But they will know who to talk to, right? So I think that making that process very clear and that they are shared decision makers in the approach and not simply the staff that do it is very, very important. And lastly, I speak from some of FHI 360's work with the HIV Prevention Trials Network. There are community work groups and there are definitely folks who've talked about long-standing requests and expectations around that professional development piece. Right? So making sure that those community health workers, yes, they're getting paid. Great. What training do they actually want? Would they like to see in that work that they're doing with their community? Do they have intentions to start running programs their own? Really thinking about how to bring in the, the benefits to them directly, and that does include the manuscripts, the outcomes, the, the grants that come afterwards. I think each of those processes can be really useful. I'm actually just going to add one, one brief thing based on um, an experience with a, a study in Haiti. Um, is that we realized after a while that we should have done some kind of preparatory work to really understand the way that um, uh, hierarchy was was functioning um, with within a, a group of, of community uh, health workers and uh, and that was something that also related to the question of translation um, so just to say that you know, uh, yeah, the complexity of social relationships, um, yeah, can can be something to engage with everywhere. Thanks. Um, it's not really an answer, but to sort of uh, problematize some of the notions. You know, we we have um, uh, the Partners in Health works with a, a community worker, health worker based model or company of tours, and um, the, one of the examples from Rwanda where. The country went from, in the last 20 years, has had the you know, um, most significant improvements in under five mortality, maternal mortality in, in history. Um, and it was all based on a very like low income community worker based model. And so people then started coming to Partners in Health and saying, well, can we do reverse innovation, which I think is a, not a good term. But um, I see what they're saying when I work in Boston and see that we do a very poor job of you know, follow up and working with uh, you know, community medicine on adherence and things like that. So there is certainly a uh, uh, role to learn from, from these programs, but we've got to think of a better name than what reverse. <laughs> I think an important point to make about community health workers, especially in LMICs, is that we often, when I say we here, I mean people like you and me who sit in global circles, often assume that they should not be paid. In fact, people have written papers about the ways in which their intrinsic motivation is enough and should be preserved. This is, one of, again, one of the extractive mechanisms of how global health works. Some privileged people sit in some privileged rooms and decide that some underprivileged people should work and sustain health systems for free. And it's a sin. And um, we'll just ask Dr. Bhattacharya to chime in. Um, do you have anything to add, Dr. Sanjoy, to that question? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, 
we organized two very similar global health history seminars in Harare with the University of Zimbabwe. And one of the seminars, and the recordings exist in the database, if anyone wants to follow up, pointed out that in Zimbabwe, there were between seven to 10 different community worker schemes working site by site, but not working with each other. And when we pushed in the Q&A session why that was the case, it was because different global health funders had their own agendas and funding these different units. And, 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 and this was alongside the government funded community health worker scheme. So clearly uh, uh, an ethical role that the WHO headquarters and regional offices need to play in this regard is to create a standard of practice for funding and empowering uh, community health workers where nation and uh, states, national governments, and sub-national governments have a voice in, in, in being able to deploy all the community health workers in unison rather than balkanize a very important workforce at district level to come back to what say was saying. I mean, this is an extremely important level. So uh, I would urge all of you to listen to that recording and listen to what's happening. And this was a very brave uh, a district level manager coming out and telling us about his experience and we wouldn't have been aware of this uh, uh, till unless he had actually been honest about his field level experience and which is why I think meetings like these are very important. Thank you, I've finished. Hi, can you hear me? It's very low down. <laughs> um, I'm Gavin Yeomi, I'm a professor here at Duke. Um, Laura, Yadu, Andrea, thank you for organizing such a spectacular uh, day. So we, um, we are at the Academy, and many of you are from the Academy. Uh, universities of Sydney, Harvard, Duke, um, UNC. And we have talked today about how the Academy incentivizes scholars to retain their power and amass their power through grants, through being first authors. Um, how do we blow that up? How do we incentivize faculty to give away and disempower themselves to share their power? The incentive structures are so not there. Is there any way that you can see a radical change in that? Are there any signs that we could share? Okay, so uh, one of the most effective ways, in my opinion, to blow up uh, this inequity is to have thoughtful clinicians uh, in our midst. And I think what we're seeing today, just in this panel and the panel before, we have thoughtful clinicians. And why do I say that's important? Because people like me with a history background are already working uh, at a disadvantage. I mean, I don't even have to, I mean, I'm a privileged brown, as say would say, uh, in terms of, you know, being coming from a so-called high caste family in India, uh, middle class family, educated. Uh, uh, but my race gives me disadvantage. But the bigger disadvantage, I think, in global health discussions is my background in history. So uh, I think the most effective way to blow up this kind of inequity that's afflicting global health is to have very thoughtful clinicians who are able to understand the complexities in both disciplines and then problematize the whole mass of information that there is and then challenge those who seek to narrowly define global health and control the purse strings. So that's my view and I end here. I struggle with that question very deeply. Um, I think that as long as we privilege a certain kind of knowledge, as long as we assume that the paper published in the Lancet or in New England Journal of Medicine is any more consequential than the knowledge in the heads of district health managers, for example, as long as we think that there's something prestigious and special and noble and accomplished about our status as the academy, I'm afraid the system itself will control us. I, I don't think that there is much to change apart from what goes on in our minds. And I understand that there are power structures and systems, but those systems will not change until we start to think differently about what matters, about what kinds of knowledge matters in global health. Uh, 
Um, I'd like to s cite the work of John Yanidis, who's a uh, polymath out at Stanford. Uh, he basically published a paper that show, pr mathematically proves uh, how uh, most published research findings are false. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend it. There's an Atlantic article about him, but there, that's in PLOS Medicine. He also has another article on um, why most clinical research is useless. And it's very well buttressed. Uh, um, He's got papers on nutritional epidemiology, et cetera. And some of the recommendations that come out of that are, um, one, that we should have more quality publications than quantity. So, you know, researchers are only should be allowed one publication per year in the first or last author position. Um, they must still be fighting over who gets the, the better paper, but at least people are starting to focus on not getting out there, you know, 15, false papers a year, not false, but just useless. Let's go with useless, I'm a pragmatist. That's, um, and, and the other thing is in the academic ladders, you know, we've been working hard on this at Harvard and with little success is to, you know, reward things like innovation instead of numbers of publications, reward um, publication in, you know, more radical local journals than just uh, Lancet stuff. Because it, I'm not going anywhere either if, if uh, if, if these things don't happen. And so um, I think uh, it's a, I'm, w with a conference like this, I'm, I'm heartened, because uh, usually I have a, you can see I have a hermeneutic of suspicion for almost all social processes. But for the future of global health, I am heartened by, you know, the fact that it's going to be in your hands and in these guys' hands, because uh, uh, they did a wonderful job with this, and I'm actually like, optimistic about something for once. <laughs> So since I'm from, I'm primarily based in the humanities, I'm not in the same specific economy of, uh, of publication credit. I want to offer just a brief couple of thoughts in addition to what my, my speak, the other speakers have said that I think is really important. So one is that I would argue that blowing up the system is more of a marathon than a sprint. And I think that we have to grapple with these processes and questions from here on out. And that's going to take everybody in this room doing their part to contribute to that, and that it just has to keep going beyond this particular session, conversations that you've had. It just has to keep going. I will also say that we have to be thinking about the other environments in which we are doing our scientific research, like myself sitting at a nonprofit. I'm not at an academic institution, and a lot of these same processes are playing out, and we can grapple with them there, and we can try to challenge them there, and that's worth doing too, and that's a marathon in and of itself as well. And I think when it comes to the credit that we're expected to take as scientists, and when we're thinking about funding and publications and how to get to the next step of our careers, Yes, we do have to do that, but we can do that the best way that we know how while we're challenging ourselves with these really difficult questions, doing the best that we can and stepping out when we're not the right person. I recently had someone ask me, why is it that all the work you do is US based? Because I have yet to convince myself that I'm the right person to go into some other context and I can do better than the people that are there. And until I can convince myself of that, Leisha's gonna be right here, you can find her in Durham, maybe in Baltimore, and that's where I'll be. So, thank you. Okay, everyone. Um, we've come to the end of our conference. Join me again in, in a round of applause for our amazing speakers, Sanjoy.